Hey guys, happy new year to everybody. Thank you for tuning in. Uh, I have my good friend Craig Trulia with me. Thank you for coming on, Craig. Uh, Craig is going to, um, we're going to get into his new book for anyone who doesn't know. It's called The Rise and Fall of the Papacy and Orthodox Perspective. The The cover is, I, you can't see because of my fake background. I wish I was there, but uh, <laughs> you can see it from Craig. You see it there? And then on oh, the back go. side, look at the back. I like how there's the chairs and then one has fallen. That's really I wonder cool. which one that is. <laughs> and why is there fallen? <laughs> why is there fallen? Uh, uh, we're gonna get into um the early period. Um, we're gonna like we're gonna talk about um the time of history that we were all together, and then Craig is going to uh, also tell us about some of the time after that too um craig thanks for coming on bro it's great to be on i'm really excited about this show awesome awesome i'm happy uh so this i don't think um i i mean i don't know i have I'm not in many online circles i'm just in the oo ones so the oo typically like they are in real life they're they're not very concerned with what's going on in the other communions. They're very to themselves. So I don't know if the OO know. Um, this is this book is kind of a big deal uh, because mm -hmm. I don't know of another book that's out that has um, how do you say kind of a whole or cumulative um, uh, addresses like the big picture of the papacy in detail as much as this one does um and for a compare and contrast for anybody who's looking into that everyone who's open-minded for for both sides check this one out and actually uh before we get started craig um just the the question does does your book does it, it does it have anything to do with the other books that have come out for the papacy in the similar time period or is it just no. coincidental yeah not to disappoint them the answer is no <laughs> as well, so no, as much no as, drama no drama here guys no drama here no drama it's yeah. to be honest with my book i've been announcing my book was coming out this year more than uh, about a year ago um and when lofton's book came out like two weeks before then i'm like Oh, that's interesting timing. And I'm sure he wasn't even paying attention whether I had a book coming out. And I just kind of worked out that way. Well, um, what about the, Eric's the, book, Craig? Eric's book, I mean, uh, Eric's book gives the ideas like, well, if he could write it, you know, of course I could I could outright that sort of outright in that sort of book. But the real inspiration was um Keys Over the Christian World by mm. Scott Butler and John Calarafi. Got it. Because that book actually had very in-depth treatment of the primary sources, but it pretty much was a, I forget what they call these books, but it was pretty much like a book with sources in it. It doesn't so much have a narrative. It does not so much have historical analysis. And there's actually a very good place for a book like that mm -hmm. because you don't get a lot of bias. You just get there's a bunch of sources. You yeah. interpret them however, is you, however you please. It should, um, this book it should is very like different that. than that. Yeah. I'm sorry. I said it should always be that way. I think for scholars, it well, we should try to par, uh, be impartial, but yeah. also it's important when a, a scholar shows. Well, what's the thread here that you can't see because you have to piece them together and you have to offer an interpretation because uh, this the plain mean the language doesn't make something clear or something like that. Yeah. So this book is more of a standard academic history book because it does offer interpretation it's very clear with its historical methodology which generally speaking you don't have in this genre um, people just kind of make up their historical methodology or just presume their worldview is automatically correct and they operate from that vantage point yep. um but this book does kind of start with this is how we read history i don't take a lot of words to do it so don't feel intimidated um, and what we find, it's a, it's a holistic, orthodox approach. I do think there'd be differences of a nuanced nature of our Oriental Orthodox versus what I am, Eastern Orthodox. Mm. And that's why I want to kind of offer the challenge to everyone watching 
It's this this book is the Eastern Orthodox attempt to offer a narrative of how the ecclesia, how did the episcopacy of the church start? Because it's not just about the papacy, it's just how the papacy fits in the overall episcopacy. And how did the papacy's role in this then diminish according to the you know pristine original uh prototype of what an episcopacy is, right? So meaning how did the papacy fall from what it was supposed to be like any other patriarchy? Now, the if a Roman Catholic, I venture to guess this, if a Roman Catholic author does rise and the fall of the Orthodox Church, and it could be about both of us, I suppose, right? Mm -hmm. It would be about how we did submit to Rome. And it'd be very interesting because Rome violates canons while those who don't submit to Rome aren't violating canons, right? So like they then have to be very transparent while it's like, well, the canons aren't the be all end all and these universal precedents aren't the be all end all. And so kind of, I think when someone attempts something like this and lays the bear what the presuppositions are, what we presume upon is the church and is not. And so I think an Oriental Orthodox author authors should really write, and maybe you, Subdeacon, mm -hmm. needs to write a book called Rise and Fall of the Byzantine Church or something like that, mm -hmm. right? Because that will lay to bear our differences in a way where you kind of have to, because you have to offer a narrative as to what went wrong. Mm -hmm. And then you have to identify why it's wrong, right? Good, good point. And so it's, it, it's really interesting. I would look forward to such a project like that. Yeah, that's a great idea. Um, and in, in, um, in a very pro preliminary way, I feel like my my master's thesis right now um, is kind of the beginning of such such a project. I think uh, for uh, for anyone who doesn't know, Craig's book it's not just like a collection of of sources where he is kind of he's he's trying to paint the anti papist narrative and quote mining. That's not what it is. There are very um, original ideas in 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 which he shows uh, sources for uh, that us kind of on this online community sometimes we just take these things as givens. But Craig challenges the narrative. For example, um, the whole thing about um, Stephen uh, Pope Stephen and the baptism thing, uh, and everyone says, oh, "Yeah, Rome was right." Even the Eastern Eastern Christians are, "Oh, yeah, but that was the right." But Craig, Craig shows the sources for, no, that's not, it's not so simple. It's not, it's not so, it's not so black and white like that. The same way, uh, Craig, with, when you talk about the uh, Malichian schism, uh, just by name, you say, actually, it should be called the Roman schism because Melitius was in, was on the right side of that. Like that was the, the, the churches in communion with him were the church in that sense. So if, there's and I think you do a good job of showing that um, the idea of a universal excommunication of a single from from a single patriarch to another it wasn't recognized as such whether in that case or in the case of maybe we can get into later Celestine and the stories or however you want to go through it but I just want the reader to keep the or the, the viewer to keep it in mind when he, they're reading because it's going to give another side of the story. Yeah, it's uh, in all honesty, I don't think this is a very complicated book as swords. It doesn't use very big words. Mm. It it's doesn't very have well very, absolutely. It, very well yeah, it doesn't have very long sentences. I think it's challenging the people because it just it's the first time they've ever seen an orthodox narrative ever, mm -hmm. even from an orthodox source. Sure. Everyone always presumes upon just kind of the Western Roman Catholic Protestant way of looking at things that like if you go, all right, we're Erase the whole chalkboard. We're going to start from first principles here, <laughs> right? Mm -hmm. And build the narrative from that. And I think if someone reads the book twice, they'll realize, oh, wait, this is actually very simple. You have to kind of see, but you have to see it from a perspective that is not something that's common in the English language. Uh, mm -hmm. This is why for years people would ask me, what book do you recommend, you know, for me to investigate this issue? And I said, really, none. Because, mm -hmm. you know, right, I, I've been very deep in the primary sources for year, years now on this topic. And it's like, when you read the primary sources, the secondary sources just really were not talking about what the primary sources really are about. Right. Um, and so thank God I've, it's, 
I didn't think I had it in me, you know, <laughs> to be able to put something together that did that. But I do yeah, think yeah. Uh, this book does. All right. This is a big deal. I, I think the closest um, publication Oriental Orthodox have to something like this would be Father Shenouda Ishaq's book, uh, Christology and the Council of Chalcedon. It's a, it's a, it's an all-encompassing. It's like this thick, all-encompassing book about the whole controversy, beginning from the Antiochian school of Diodor, Paul of Samosata, before that, through, um, through the sixth century or whatever it was, or the two wills, etc. So. Um, that is kind of probably the the big the, the biggest thing we have right now in English, but the the concept that you are proposing um, that would be wonderful for us to kind of actually get into the nitty gritty of it. Yeah, sure. yeah I, and I think this interview will bring out most likely the first few chapters would be very similar. We don't really have differences, <laughs> which is interesting. So I I've done the hard work for you guys. You just have to kind of start changing. <laughs> From the late we'll fourth, cite you. early centuries. We'll <laughs> cite you. We'll say, Mar Craig Trulia. <laughs> <laughs> well, someone or one of the commenters already said that they'd uh, dedicate the book to me. <laughs> coming up the idea. There, there you go. It, it's an honestly important, I actually think it's an important project, and it would go a long way for us to push forward uh, the dialogue where it needs to go. Um because like I said, it's interesting because I think if a Roman Catholic apologist actually attempts doing this, um, they will find that they have a very circular system, mm -hmm. right? You know, like, well, you were, we were wrong, but Pope is never wrong anyway, even when he's wrong. Mm -hmm. And so that that's kind of bizarre. But if you have to write a history, you kind of have yeah. to lay out the facts. And that's what comes out. At least, you know, well, that's the, the presumption they're working on there. I, it's, I don't find it very personally compelling, but at least... You got to uh, make your case from the sources. Yeah. W would you say Eric Ibarra is kind of honest about landing there in that? Um, that well, I don't. I don't want to comment on his honesty or not. From what I could tell from his book, uh -huh. it's That's what I mean. The book. Yeah. Well, yeah. Let me. Ibarra. What the positive is? What he does try to do is give a century by century narrative and touches on most of the same events I touch. Mm -hmm. Um, because we're not talking about a you know a different era of history. So in that sense, the progression of the books is similar, right? Yeah. Um, I would take issue, and being that you're the only apologist that actually gets paid to teach history, I mean, years ago I was, but right, like most people actually don't know anything about the historical discipline. So this mm -hmm. critique might go above their heads, is that his methodology. Apart from you, you hear, you know, you've heard accusations of people lawyering, whatever. Let's not even get to that. Let's talk strictly history. Hmm. Seems to be very secondary source centric, meaning you'll have an idea. You'll show it. Well, here's a Roman Catholic source that admits the idea. Here's an Anglican source that admits the idea. Here's an Eastern Orthodox source that admits the idea. So it's almost like a, like a panel, right? If the I panel see. agrees, then it's correct. Like and so... Yeah. That that sounds very compelling to someone who's not trained in history, because like, well, the expert the expert panel also all agrees, so then I will accept this premise. Mm -hmm. But that's far from actually making a historical case. You don't you don't actually see scholars making historical cases that way. They will cite scholarship. They'll show that you know this this word study shows this um, this overall conclusion about this era of history shows that. But they don't run everything by a panel. They always try to prove out a premise from the primary sources. Absolutely. And so I, I think that's a subtle difference. It's not so subtle if you study history. It's actually pretty egregious if you study history. Um, and I think that's probably the main difference. Like for me, um, there'd be no contest between our books because of that difference in approach. But I think to maybe the historical layman, they might not even – really appreciate that. And they might actually find what he's doing easier, right? He's just saying, here's the panel. They say, yes, survey says, ding, 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 ding. And, and that's pretty easy to follow. Um, but that's far from actually proving a historical case. Historians don't operate that way. Sure, sure. Yeah, that makes total sense. Um, primary sources are, are much more, I think, um, effective 
than a panel of modern scholars. Absolutely. And it's not uh, so to be a few scholarship. I mean, I just want to be clear, like there's 800 something footnotes. It's got a very long bibliography in the end. It actually cites a lot, a lot of scholarship and newer scholarship than let's say your Bowers book is an example, or even a lot of academic books. Mm -hmm. So it's not that I don't depend on scholarship. It's just that we don't derive historical conclusions from scholarship. We use scholarship to help us derive historical conclusions if we are, you know, scholars in our own right anyway. Absolutely. And for everybody, too, it's it's the it's large font. It's easy to see uh, the like Craig said, um, the words are not too complicated or else I wouldn't be able to read it. So uh, let's do it. Let's do it, Craig. Where, where do you want to start, brother? I start from the beginning. Let's just start. Can do, uh, yeah. Can we do an overview of the, of the centuries? Can you do that? Like first century, second century kind of thing? Well, like how, how, else, how do you want to take the, the, the route of the show? Whatever well, I think it's, we will, be in this as an Oriental Orthodox channel, I will just focus on the era of history we have in common, and maybe sure. towards the ends, we could start seeing where we start diverging, and, and that would sure. be interesting, because what sure. we're trying to do here is to get your side ready to write your version of the book, right? <laughs> <laughs> um, so, I would start from the beginning, which is, <laughs> let me just say this as a general overall thing. Your side, maybe less so really egregiously, the Eastern Orthodox side, the Anglicans, they'll take anything that's about St. Peter, anything that's about papal primacy, and they just pretend it doesn't exist, right? Mm. They're just like, oh, it's just flowery language, or they didn't say that, or, you know, it's uh, it's a forgery or whatever, right? It doesn't exist. And so when someone studies this topic and finds, wait a second, there's really important stuff about St. Peter and the Church of Rome, it the side that pretends that stuff doesn't exist loses all credibility. And that I would say thrusts a lot of well-meaning people into Roman Catholicism. Yeah. You throw the and, baby out of the bathwater. Sure. Yeah. And so like one thing that I have found very interesting studying this topic is you cannot ignore what's said both in the West and also what we're going to find. I'll, I'll cover briefly here um, in Coptic sources and stuff about um, St. Peter and about the Church of Rome, and and pretend it doesn't exist, pretend it's not important, because they wouldn't put these sort of emphases on these things if they weren't important. And sure. so the question then is, what's it actually about? You know, my book shows that there's usually three things. One has to do with St. Peter's role in the Episcopacy, which I'll put most of my emphasis on in this show, but also some people aware, there's the fact that Rome had this primacy of honor. They they regularly gave money and they would uh, have these encyclicals, which had theological teaching in it, which um, churches would regularly receive in the ancient times. Um, and also within their own patriarchate in the West, they were the key city. And so whenever there's writing in Latin, particularly between a Latin writer and um, Rome, you're going to have very deferential language because you had never addressed your superior in a disrespectful way in that ancient context. Mm -hmm. And so these three things combined give us the papal primacy statements, the very lofty language. Um, and But because we're not from an era, moderns automatically think Vatican I. They're not thinking of teaching authority, the fact that they're, you know, they're paying for a lot of things very far away because Rome was the capital of the empire. Um, the fact that some of these statements are Latin between Latin, and so they're going to have a different sort of affect. But also, I want to focus on the idea that we never hear about, which is St. Peter's the origin of the Episcopate, mm -hmm. right? This, this is interestingly something that is scandalous both to Orthodox and Roman Catholics alike, and for different reasons. It's, it's scandalous to Orthodox because it almost sounds like, well, that means we're wrong about the papacy, right? And so they just don't even want to go down this road. Yeah which is to our detriment because it's in the patristic. So we, ha we have to deal with this, honestly. But also, ironically, it wouldn't in the first millennium, but now, since Vatican I, works against the Roman Catholic side. Because mm -hmm. the Roman Catholic view is Petrine inheritance is very exclusive for Rome. And if everyone's a successor of Peter, um, you kind of lose that exclusivity by default. Yeah, And so it's a kind of an inconvenient truth for everyone, which... There's always great, always great history when you could show that, hey, you're all wrong. <laughs> you need to listen to this. <laughs> um, so in the book, what I, I cover in detail 
is you could find among the schismatics, among the um, what became the Oriental Orthodox Church, what became the Eastern Orthodox Church, what became the Roman Catholic Church. I'm being very impartial here, right? Of, of course, I think our church was the original one. You think yours is, et cetera. But you find among all of them the same idea. The same idea. Mm. And so how does that happen? And how, how does that happen when everyone has the same idea? And so I make the case that we have uh, from St. Papias and we have from, is it from Hagesippus? I forget who Clement Alexander also quotes. But we have sources from the first to early third century that offer genealogies where anytime they offer a genealogy, the episcopate starts with St. Peter, at least with one of them, right? Like, because you need more than one a, a bishop to appoint a bishop. Mm -hmm. But he's in all of them. And so you go, wait, what's, what's this detail here? Then you see St. Cyprian saying the unity starts with one. And then he said the next sentence says with St. Peter and the rest, then the rest of the apostles. And so we see, wait, well, St. Cyprian's presuming it starts with St. Peter. We see the same in St. Optatus, yeah. um, who I don't think may be a saint for your communion, but it's, we see this in fourth century writers. We see this in, I believe it's Gregory Nazianzus. Um, but I want to now talk about some other sources you would not expect to see it in. Now, a saint in the Coptic Orthodox communion is Theodosius of Alexandria. Hmm. He was kicked out and put into exile from Alexandria to Constantinople for really the majority of his episcopate. And near the end of his life, he wrote a um, Marian homily about the Dormition of mm. the Theotokos. And so in this uh, homily, Jesus addresses St. Peter as Peter, Peter, my bishop. And it's sort of like, oh, that doesn't prove anything. Right? That's when we go apologist brain. We go, that doesn't approve anything. Here's what we need to be aware of in the Marian homilies. There are three of them that included the detail where the apostles are arguing over who gets to uh, lead the funeral procession, essentially. Um, and this begins with Pseudo John, which is probably around Palestine. It's a Greek Marian homily. Then there is the Book of Mary's Repose, which is an Ethiopian source. And there's a source from John of Thessalonica, which is obviously Macedonia. So we have kind of a full gamut in the Mediterranean here, where they all quote St. John, where St. Peter says, well, you know, you're the virgin apostle. You should lead the procession. And St. John says, no, you are our bishop. You should lead us. Mm -hmm. And so if you've never heard of this before, you go, wait a second, he, Peter's the bishop of the apostles, right? All those kind of little connections us making with genealogies is made very explicit here, but it's found in a Greek source, in a Oriental source that is written in Greek, and an Ethiopian source, which is, by the way, because it's a Gnostic Ethiopian source, is completely schismatic and outside the pale of the church. But how does it find it in all of them? Mm. There's a common tradition. You can say, well, one dependent on the other, but there is a broader oral tradition within the Marian homilies, which is why St. Theodosius uh, Alexander, your saint, again, not mine, states, Peter, Peter, my bishop, is how he's addressed, because anyone aware of the oral tradition of the Dormition would have been aware of this story about Peter being the bishop of the apostles. It finds itself in passing in Theodosius Alexander, but it's there. Um, in the uh, Sahidic fragments of the D Dormition homilies, uh, Jesus tells uh, St. Peter that I've given you the keys of the kingdom, right? And this is not something told to the other apostles in those homilies. But I think um, more convincingly is the homily, and I think it's um, forgetting the Egyptian language. Uh, it's not Sahidic. It's uh, uh, Bahiric. Yes. Yeah. Yes. And it's the homily of pseudo Evodius. Um, which, by the way, in Eastern Orthodox tradition, this is an authentic homily. Um, I'm just giving the academic. I haven't done enough research to know for sure if this really is falsely ascribed or not. But that being said, this statement's in it. The Lord gave a blessing to us all that day and appointed my father Peter archbishop and we the lesser disciples. We He made some of us presbyters, I being one of them. Right? So we see this consistent detail within the, like I said, Ethiopian um, 
in other Egyptian, because the Ethiopian homily must have originated in Egypt. Hmm. But all these Egyptian homilies, we're clearly, St. Peter is the Bishop of the Apostles. And this connects to what's explicitly said, like I already said, in three other Dormition homilies that are throughout the Mediterranean. Um, and with apostolic succession lists, explicit statements from popes beginning in the fifth century saying, you know, several Greek fathers. So th this is something that's very consistent, but I just want to point out to your audience, it's also found in distinctly Coptic sources. And because this is a tradition, I think, despite, because I don't see any textual dependence between pseudo Evodius and those fragments and Theodos Alexandria, it's almost, they're borrowing from the same oral tradition and that's in the oral tradition, which means it's older than all those written homilies. And yet, when those traditions were written down, and this, is, I think, is the clincher, they were not in communion with the Roman church. All right. Right? I, I, and I so would... clearly, they didn't, it was just in the oral tradition, and they found this repulsive. They just would have left it out. But clearly, exactly. the way they understood it didn't offend their sensibilities that St. Peter was the origin of Episcopate. I mean, for crying out loud, um, <laughs> Alexander styled themselves a Petrine bishopric. So why yeah. would they? <laughs> right? <laughs> it's, you know, it's, and so it's only like with time and a polemical environment that's become ahistorical that we've lost an appreciation for this teaching. Um, and so hopefully what's in this book will help Eastern and Oriental Orthodox creator appreciate that uh, Petrine inheritance that's, I think, very clear in the earliest sources, uh, beginning, I think, with St. Papias. Yeah, absolutely, Craig. I don't think any Oriental Orthodox would... Uh, have any issue with anything uh, regarding, as they call it, high Petrine uh, tradition, because it's all over our rites. You see it everywhere in the Syriac, uh, in the Syriac tradition. You can't get away from it from the earliest times until later. As Saint Ephraim, he talks about Saint Peter all the time, the head of the apostles, the prince of the apostles, um, the new Moses. We have in our daily prayers, we say Moses in the Old Testament, Simon in the New Testament. It's um, it's something that is, it's just a theme. Um, uh, like we don't have the, discrepan the, the discrepancy in the grammar that the Greek would have regarding Matthew 16, for example. I'm sure you've heard this, where it's like Petros and Petra in the Greek. In the Aramaic, the Syriac, when Jesus is speaking to them in Aramaic, it's the same word. It's kepa kepa in both spots. So um, uh, we, we have a synod, we have a synod in 628 where we call our patriarch, uh, who was uh, Patriarch Athanasius, uh, Patriarch of Antioch at the time, 628, synod of Marmeti. We call him the ecumenical patriarch of patriarchs, Peter, the head of the church, we call him. And then uh, in 785, um, uh, we have the patriarch was George at the time. We call him patriarch of the apostolic see of St. Peter, the head of the apostles. Um, uh, we, and when till this day, uh, and when I don't, I don't know if you know about the schismatic Indians that are in Oriental Orthodoxy, there's a schismatic, yes, there, yeah, there's the Carolines yeah. are split in two, even among uh, the right. Oriental, the Syriac, when, right. yeah. So when we when we excommunicated them. The bull of excommunication that the patriarch wrote is appealing to his Petrine authority explicitly by name. And um, to this day, whenever we get uh, encyclicals from the patriarch to read in the in the church. So I think I don't know if you guys have something similar to this. Um, be, uh, so before we read from the Bible, depending on what section of the Bible we're going to read from, there's a particular hymn we have to chant before. Mm -hmm we read the, the the particular reading. So if you're reading from the Pauline epistles, you have to, there's a hymn, you a particular hymn you chant. It's Galatians 1, 8, and 9. You chant it before you read the Pauline epistle. Um, uh, the gospel, you, you there's a there's a hymn we chant before we read the gospel. And then the, the apostolic writings, we call them, which are Acts, James, John, and Peter, um, we also have a hymn we chant before we read them. That same hymn we chant it before we read any encyclical from the patriarch. So his letter is, as far as everyone is concerned, equal 
to the a, a reading from the apostolic uh, writings. So in the sense of this kind of, and maybe we can get into this a little bit more later in detail, but the kind of infallibility idea, it's like he's infallible as long as he's um, not contradicting the tradition that has been received for the 2000s. Well, and I think it lays bare. The yeah. Western reader sees this stuff and they automatically conclude, well, this is Vatican I in C form, or this is full-blown Vatican I, or whatever. They immediately go to Roman Catholicism. Hmm. But right in the Oriental context, that just would make no sense. These things would not be offensive, and they would not be understood that way. No one's hmm. reading those things in Syria or an English translation here or whatever, and and um, jumping to the conclusion that, oh, that means the, you know, the... Oriental Orthodox Patriarch of Antioch has supremacy over the church and has infallibility or any of those things. No one's jumping to that conclusion. Right. Yeah. Um, it which shows you all of these it, things. Yeah. So let me speak just down the people. It shows you the interpretation that there is something else going on here other than um, Roman Catholic papalism is not cope because it exists. <laughs> it exists in the ancient church. It still exists today. And it doesn't carry that meaning that Western readers automatically jump to. You know we have um, we have a service. I think you guys have it. It's the evening. So you go to mass, uh, liturgy Palm Sunday, and then at night, what do you call it? Uh, we call it Nahire, uh, the lights, oh. the virgins, I, the service of the I virgins. I forget what they. I, I don't. I just know when to show up. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> you're, well, you're a subdeacon, so you probably know all the little. Things. I don't know it in English, but in in Syriac we call it Nahire. So. Um, uh, we go and um, we are sad there. Everything is, the lights are off. We know the stoles are flipped and they're inverted. Um, and we're, it's a, it's a, it's a morning service because St. Peter lost the keys. We say he lost the keys when he denied Christ. So we're going through that uh, uh, passion week, you know? So uh, the, the concept of, he can lose the keys. Obviously, he regained them, but he lost the keys when he denied him. So this is also telling of, of uh, the way we're understanding the Petrine primacy and Petrine succession, etc. And, and, and it ties together nicely the multiple interpretation book gets into in the Father's said, you know, what is the Matthew 16, 18 confession? And, you know, it's people say the confession of just Christ and that doctrine, and that's the rock. But these things aren't necessarily in some sort of contradiction. One father says this, one father says that. Um, they correspond with one another. And I think that's a context where obviously that would correspond. You don't make the confession um, anymore. You don't have those keys anymore. Mm -hmm. <laughs> You're not that rock anymore. Right. right. Okay. Um, so do you, do you want to get into, let's get into some commonly uh, asked stuff so sure um we'll go into the the situation with pope victor if you don't mind um because sure. i think that's an early one that everybody knows about and talks about so pope victor the catholic side is see guys the pope viewed himself as being able to excommunicate whoever he wanted whenever he wanted the eastern side yeah but he couldn't do it they said they didn't let him so how how would you how do you talk about it in the book and how how do you think about it? Well, the both sides are wrong. Yeah. Um, <laughs> you know, it's let me post something very simple where we can all agree upon at least if you read enough. You if you don't agree because you just don't know that's different. Mm. Under whose jurisdiction was Crete? Was Achaia in Greece? Macedonia? Serbia? Whose jurisdiction were those areas under until the 8th century? Mm. Rome, right? No one yeah. disagrees with this, right? Right. And so the question is, well, how about Asia Minor? How about modern-day Turkey? Were they under Roman jurisdiction or not? Um, I make the argument, yes. Um, I make that argument strictly because we have to get into what the traditional view is of what settles a jurisdiction. And not the board people, I won't get too much detail, but it has to do where the relics of an apostle is. That includes a lesser apostle. So, for example, in the 5th century, um, the Bishop of Arles, there was a Hilary of Arles gone to a, 
uh, scuffle with uh, Pope Leo the Great, who's a saint for us, and long story short, and then us for the Eastern Orthodox. And long story short, Saint Leo the Great's like, well, we have Peter's relics, and we are the capital of the empire, right? We actually have a novella, it's called, a Western Roman law that explicitly cites those things as the basis for Rome having the ability to appoint bishops in Gaul. But you know what the Metropolitan of Arles wrote back? Their mm -hmm. synod wrote back, we have the relics of St. Troponius. Now think about that. When have you ever heard that the relics of a saint has anything to do with any of these questions? It has everything to do with these questions, but you never hear it in apologetics. And so the kind of the logic is the person who evangelized the land, who's a bishop, is its bishop, right? But if he appoints someone in its place because he moves on evangelizing, He's like the archbishop or metropolitan, and whoever's there is the local bishop. Mm -hmm. But the local bishop is, in a sense, the subservient, uh, lesser in the hierarchy than the archbishop or the metropolitan, the one that's higher up the hierarchy. So clearly, um, St. Paul would have been the bishop that's above Asia Minor. He evangelized them. We know from 1 Peter. So did St. Peter evangelize Asia Minor. He wrote to all those churches. Right. So there are the bishops, and the local bishops there were the suffragan bishops. So when they died, wouldn't it make sense that Asia Minor was under Roman jurisdiction? If we just go by everything we know about how jurisdiction works and with the agreed upon fact that we already shown that as far as Crete, the islands um, near Crete, the Aegean islands, uh, Mas Macedonia, that all that was under Roman jurisdiction. Why wouldn't Asia Minor be under that jurisdiction for the same reason? Well, this makes sense why there was a debate over this. Um, because who moved to Ephesus? It John. wasn't St. Peter, St. John. So we had another apostle kind of invade the canonical territory. And I'm sure the apostles really didn't care about that stuff back then. Right. And so it kind of created an apostolic succession reset, which now takes Asia Minor and puts them out of Roman jurisdiction. And so and also, Craig, sorry yes. to interrupt, but there was also St. Paul having putting St. Timothy there. Well, and this this is the and this I think proves the case because when Polycrates of Ephesus writes against um, Pope Victor, saying you know pretty much you can't tell us what to do, um, he only he didn't get excommunicated over Easter. Pope Victor's synod already condemned him over Easter, mm. so the schism wasn't over Easter. Pope Victor excommunicated him for this letter, where Polycrates said we got the relics of Philip of John. He goes down a list of oh, people's God. relics. Yeah. Right, and he says, and we must obey God rather than man, because right, the their inheritance from God are these relics and these saints. But why does he leave out Saint Timothy, whose relics were in Ephesus? And we know for a fact because all our communions, including your own, my own, we all commemorate the day those relics were transferred to Constantinople. Yeah, why? And why, so the why reason does he leave it out. Well, he leaves him out because it would work against his argument that he wasn't under Roman local jurisdiction, <laughs> right? Because if the relics of Timothy are there, then Rome could rightly argue, well, his Timothy's relics are there, and Timothy was under St. Peter, is under St. Paul, and Paul's relics are in Rome, so you're under us, mm. right? I, and I, so why have this exaggerated argument over relics? It's not. Here's what it's not about. Oh, they're just stupid and talk about bones and there were quaint, dumb people back then. No. If there's a detail there, there's a reason. We already know in other situations when they cite the relics, it has to do with local jurisdiction. Like I said, St. Leo Great and Hilary of Arles. We already know this. That, that's an explicit fact. Mm -hmm. And so this offers the reason why after that statement, Polycrates was excommunicated, right? It wasn't yeah. over Easter. Yeah. Right. It was over when he said, we obey God rather than men. And he cited all these relics. And what did St. Irenaeus write back? He said, well, you're the, I forget the name of the earlier Pope. Was it Sixtus? But an earlier Pope with St. Polycarp celebrated liturgy and Polycarp presided over it. Mm -hmm. Now, I don't know about Oriental Orthodox liturgics, but in Eastern Orthodox liturgics, the only way a bishop could preside over the liturgy is if they're superior or equal to everyone else there. So right. in your communion, hmm. if the Patriarch Alexandria and the Patriarch of um, Syria, uh, hmm. of the of Antioch, and of the, the Catholicos of Armenia all concelebrated, hmm. um, 
right? It's that would be okay if one presided because they're equals, but you couldn't have. I'm just going to make it up. Um, whatever local bishop in Kerala and him preside over patriarchs. Would There's that no be way. True for you guys? There's yeah, no, no way. way. Yeah. So right. So for anyone who understands liturgics, this is a very obvious detail. The mm -hmm. detail is Polycarp is being recognized as a fellow patriarch because he could preside over the liturgy. Mm -hmm. And so Irenaeus is writing the victor saying, your church has already conceded local administration in Asia Minor. And he wrote that, as, as Eusebius says, to the world's churches, century in Rome. So this ultimately wasn't about Easter. It was about the church saying, no, Rome, you're invading the canonical jurisdiction of someone else. And Rome wasn't claiming universal jurisdiction. They were claiming something quite reasonable, like, well, but Timothy's relics are there, right? It's it's not a crazy case. I, I personally feel that uh, St. John's relics are a little more convincing um, on, on that note. But that being said, at least Rome had a case, but they were censured because they have already conceded jurisdiction um, in a sense, Grad and Otto Kefli would call it today, um, earlier in the second century. So you you don't read this anywhere else, but how do people make sense of all these facts about the relics? How do we make sense of Irenaeus' response? How do we make sense of Victor only excommunicating after the relics came up? How do we make sense of, and uh, his name's skipping my mind, but in the third century, he uh, wrote a, he's a saint, he's from Asia Minor, and he wrote about the dating of Pascha. And in passing, he even says there were striving over primacy where, and it appeared that Polycrates had primacy in Asia Minor at that time. So his interpretation of the events is over primacy. So this is not me making stuff up. This is actually what's in the sources. Right. What's making stuff up is to say, oh, it's just about Easter because the sources don't say that. Or Pope Victor was claiming universal jurisdiction. And for us saying, but we said no to it. And Rome says, but at least he tried. That's not in the sources either. What's in the sources is a local dispute over jurisdiction. And that's what happened. Yeah, th those are great points. Um, uh, you know, it's funny because the I've thought about and read about the whole uh, poly, uh, Polycrates and uh, Pope Victor thing multiple times. And it's never occurred to me when he's telling him Polycarp presided over the liturgy. I, I don't know why it didn't occur to me to think about it. It's a, such an obvious point. Like there, it's not. It's not. I don't even think it's allowed in the canons for a bishop to preside if a patriarch's present. Oh, it's impossible. Yeah, <laughs> but this, but this is the issue when scholars write things and not and 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 not um, clergymen. Right. Right. Because you could be Yale University, Oxford, but if you've never presided over a liturgy, it might skip your imagination. You know what I mean? Like. If I did not attend church where there's multiple bishops at the same time, how would I know? Yeah, and, and uh, right because yeah, it's uh, the, I think what the rule it, is because let, let's take Eric Yerbara for example, right? Um, maybe he's met his bishop, maybe not, which is not rare. Like maybe he met him like when they do confirmation, because I know the in their tradition they do confirmation. But like, when do you see? As an average Roman Catholic, even a big name Roman Catholic, several Roman Catholic bishops um, doing mass together. Yeah. They have so many numbers and there's just so many parishes. It's not something you walk into very often. So you could be very well read or very well noted and known and just have never seen it and not and, and just not even know, not even occur to you. Uh, but the, it's not just Eric Gabbard. have to do, it could be with Oxford Scholar because. He might go to his local parish, Anglican parish, and it's going to be the same deal. But um, I like to think the Orthodox world's a little smaller in that sense, where like we run into our bishops, bishops know our names, you know, and stuff like that. And so then you become more familiar with those things, even when you're not a bishop. Yeah, uh, I like I recent in 2018, I think it was the end of 2018, um, the Coptic Pope. And the Armenian Catholicos uh, concelebrated with the Patriarch of Antioch in Lebanon, and because it was his church's jurisdiction, he the, the Patriarch of Antioch presided, um, and it was according to the Syriac rite. So, um, correct me if I'm wrong, Craig. I didn't Polycarp go to Rome. Or yes, did, did, and so this he did. I, this makes it even more I, ridiculously I, obvious. Uh, this is yeah. Uh, it was right. Like this, if if the Pope presided over the liturgy in Rome, I mean, 
you could say, oh, well, that proves he's superior, but also it would just be obvious. Like, so for example, um, what is the synod that Constantine held against the Donatist? Um, it issued canons, but it's none of us received those canons. Uh, was it another Council of Arles? I forget its name. It was in France, though. It's in 314. Point is, when they sign, they make their subscriptions, the person who subscribed first was the metropolitan of that local city. Not because he was superior to the Pope and their legates, but because out of deference to that's where he was. So that doesn't surprise anyone, right? We don't presume the local metropolitan in France was above um, the Pope of Rome in those days because he signed first. We just realized because of geography. But right. imagine, right, there's a, a council in Rome mm -hmm. and the bishop from, I don't know, Antioch, Alexandria shows up and they get to sign first. Well, clearly they got to be at least equals to do that, yeah. right? And so right. the same was with presiding over the liturgy. Um, Polycarp had to at least be an equal to do that. It, it makes yeah. absolutely no sense from a liturgical perspective um, for that to be. And for him to be equal, he had to be considered a local patriarch. And then for the situation regarding the baptism controversy and uh, Pope Stephen and St. Yeah. Cyprian of Carthage, St. Dionysius. Um, now, the common view is that, you know, Saint, uh, Pope Stephen has the original understanding. That's the original canon. St. Cyprian and St. Dionysius and everyone submitted to it. Uh, but I think your book does a good job. And if they just think about it, see, look what the churches are practicing and the canons of the churches, they will see. That's It's not so simple because uh, the rebaptism and not rebaptism since whatever happened with Stephen and Cyprian in that time through until now, it's never been kind of this one universal thing. It's been up to the bishops to kind of, it's up, it's at the discretion of the local bishop, essentially, whether to rebaptize yeah, it's, or yeah, this, this is an issue I got into not because there's a lot of controversy in the Eastern Orthodox world over it. Mm. But that's really not why I got into it. This is a book about the Episcopacy and the papacy, right? So I had to discuss it in as much as it's relevant to ecclesiology so we could figure out what really was the Pope of Rome in the third century. So that's why I, I get into it. Yeah. Um, and so really, to really sum this up in very few words, the Pope before Stephen... Uh, St. Cornelius, who's a martyr, um, wrote in, and we presume he wrote, his synod wrote it, so when there was no pope. So the lead, lead deacon usually writes these things. So yeah. it probably was him because it keeps getting quoted back at which which by Cyprian. And, you know, it doesn't create any issue. And the statement essentially is that the bishops give their own account to God for their decision. And so the interpretation given is that no one could could uh, compel a bishop to do whatever. You could admonish them, and the bishop gives his own account to what he decides to do, right? And so when St. Stephen gets into a um, debate over this issue with St. Cyprian and St. Fermilion and St. Dynasty's Alexander, which I'm going to take most of my time talking about today, um, this gets quoted back at uh, St. Um, Stephen twice, once in a council, one in a letter. And this wasn't the first time it was quoted because it was quoted to Cornelius for that incident, and it was originally written by Pope Cornelius. So it's in a way of kind of shoving the Pope's face, well, you guys already admitted this, so how could he compel us? We'll give our own count to God over this issue, right? Now, why do I lump in Dynasty's Alexander? Because he quotes this same statement in one of his letters, it's preserved in Arminian, but also in two Syriac fragments, mm -hmm. right? So it's a, we know this is authentic because it couldn't find its way in so many different things. And it has the same demeanor and ideology we find in the fragments of his other letters because we don't have any complete letters of his really. And um, to make a long story short, he quotes St. Cyprian, who's quoting St. Pope Cornelius saying, um, this is the teaching in Alexandria. We admonish the other bishops to do this, and they will give an account to God for whatever they do, mm -hmm. right? Meaning, like, they decide what they're going to do. We tell them, we, here's what you should do. They'll give an account to God for what they do. Right. And he writes this against Pope Stephen 
warning him not to be quick to excommunicate people. So that's mm -hmm. the context of this statement. Um, I find it very bizarre in the historical treatments of this that people skip over St. Denisius of Alexandria so lightly. Because um, clearly he offers the kind of the moderate medium middle guy between mm -hmm. the feuding sides. And yeah. he, interestingly, has actually a different view of baptism. I don't even know it's the same the Oriental Orthodox Day than Cyprian, who says not even schismatics have baptism. St. Vermilion says the same thing. Um, really, the view of um, St. Denisius is as long as baptism has correct form, um, we can receive that person, and that's the directions he gives. Yeah, People presume that's the writing of Rome, of the teaching of Rome because it is now. But Denisius wrote this to Rome, presuming it wasn't their teaching at that time. And we have a follow-up letter from Denisius Alexander, where he actually says that Denisius of Rome formerly had the views of Stephen. And so that means now he had the views of Denisius of Alexander. There's two Denisius, so don't, yeah, don't right, get too right. confused. Yeah. Um, so the point is, Rome's later view of baptism matches what we find in this Alexandria because they actually changed their mind because this Alexandria taught them this, yeah. which is interesting. Wow. Now, that, that's huge. My personal opinion is that in reality, Stephen took the Roman tradition. Probably this Cornelius had this sort of same view. Uh, there's details given the book why Cornelius did. And for whatever reason, Stephen just went extreme the other way. Um, say we're just going to receive everybody. And this was scandalous to everybody, including yeah. Denisius of Alexandria, which is why Denisius of Alexandria censures Rome and says, large synods throughout the world, you know, oppose you on this. So it's actually kind of interesting that Eusebius reads this pretty clear statement, which we can match with letters that are not in Eusebius, where clearly he's opposing Rome as somehow agreeing with Rome. Because he mm -hmm. Eusebius quotes... The is out there and you're correcting Rome, and it says, look, he agreed with them. You're sort of like, what on earth is he talking about? Um, and so this is something that is subsequently, I think, confused historians. I also think in the West, because their view in baptism became not uh, that of St. Stephen, but that of Denisius about of Rome and Alexandria, that in the Donatist controversy, they kind of took what the Donatists were doing to be what Cyprian was doing, and then cast that all in a negative light. Mm -hmm. um, to the detriment of that saint, when interestingly, it was Denisius Alexandra quoting Saint Cyprian, speaking in an mm -hmm. affirmative way concerning Saint Fermilion and Saint Cyprian's um, um, view, their counsels and their view in baptism. Like he saw himself more on their side than on Stephen's side. And, and why would that be? Because if Stephen accepted absolutely everyone, including the heretics doing one immersion, Heretics that believe that were just naming Jesus Christ, but not the Father, because I thought the Father was the demiurge, meaning a Gnostic God, right? Oof. Yeah. It would make sense that he's like, well, even though I'm not as exclusive, I'll let schismatics back in as long as, you know, the novations and they have correct form. Um, but I have more in common with Cyprian and Vermilion than that crazy, you know, let everybody in no matter what sort of view. And so it's kind of interesting in modern times. We are actually taking the real St. Stephen view versus the reformed Denisius of Rome view of baptism. And I think it's a detriment to all our churches. I don't know how badly that's infiltrated Oriental Orthodoxy, but um, I would say it's becoming um, perhaps even the majority view, maybe not of anyone, any canonist in Eastern Orthodoxy, but to the average bishop, it's becoming the majority view today in Orthodoxy, hence the controversy. Well, I was just going to ask you, uh, I don't know how it... Uh... I assume the Eastern Orthodox um, application of this was the same as ours, but maybe not. Uh, so we have, for us, it's at the discretion of the bishop. So um, if uh, the way we would accept another baptism is if it did have the Orthodox form, for sure. And um, it is invalid until the church declares whether or not to accept it but off the bat it's invalid and then if we want to mm -hmm. accept your college credits we will accept them like kind of thing. that's yeah the, it's it's like the if you accept the chrismation fixes it for all times right purposes. and and um so the the concept is uh if 
if a person is, let's say there's a schismatic, uh, schismatic heretical bishop or something. I don't know if you know Marmari Emmanuel. He's kind of big on TikTok, whatever, Assyrian Church of the Yeah, East. yes, 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 the Assyrian yeah. dude. Yeah, he's uh, he's an old calendarist Assyrian bishop. He's rogue, kind of doing on his own. So if this guy, the church will view everything he's doing to be invalid and illicit, um, and it doesn't count. But if he comes in communion, if he comes into communion with the church, it's not like they're going to have a mass baptism of everybody, right? Yeah. Then in his well, union, Severus, Severus was against that, for example. Right. He accepted the baptism and, and sacraments of the Chalcedonians. Exactly. So if when he comes into communion with the church, then they will make everything that he did before. That would give it validity in the in the, in our mind. You see, but as of right now, on his own, it's it's invalid. Um, I, I so, would say we're not functionally that different. It's. Yeah, but I would presume, like, if he was baptizing people in a single immersion, just in the name of Christ and not in the Father and also the Spirit, um, it'd probably be a little more of an issue for you guys. Oh, of and course, no, no. Possible. I'm assuming he's he's doing Trinitarian, absolutely. Yeah, but but we, you know, we have we have what would be considered liberal bishops in Eastern Orthodoxy that will accept the baptism of single immersion baptisms of, of Baptists. Mm -hmm. And 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 amidst no meat about it. this, the chrismation fixes everything. And um, this is this show, this show is not to address and solve that question, but mm. it's you got to look at this ultimately not to solve that question, but rather to address the history of the papacy. And you could draw whatever conclusion you want about that collision, that question that you want. You know, mm. I'm just trying to solve this historically. I mean, if people really want my own sympathy, please. Um, I sort of am apathetic about the issue. Ultimately, I have an opinion. I just don't feel that like on fire about it. You know, to get like yeah. caught up and angry about it. People so, are very so, caught up in it. I'm not a bitch. So. Right. And uh, you said so. If if the Baptist goes into uh, your parish, say, and um, he only is received by chrismation, would you say that that de facto still, whether you like it or not, makes the baptism valid? Even though it was uh, because he was well, accepted, I'll take it as a theoretical ghost. I know for a fact that, that would never occur in the specific parish I'm in. They're old, very right. conservative theory, um, theory. But but that being said, because I've been in parishes where that would occur, right? Mm -hmm. And um, and so that being said, it's what would happen. I feel is what we see Denisius of Alexandria actually say. Right, mm. we we have one of a guy who's uh, baptized among the heretics. It sounds like it was done wrong, but he's like he's been communing with us for years, and now oh, he yes. refuses Eusebius. to commune. Uh, so yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, and it's in Eusebius. Yeah, that's right. That's right. That's right. Well, no, it's, it's not. I don't think that's in Eusebius actually, though. There's, maybe then there's maybe another I'm... account very similar to what you're saying in Eusebius okay. too. Well, the, yeah, where well, the point is, yeah, this guy's been coming the whole time. time. He's been receiving yeah. communion, and then we find out. He's, he's like and this. so I think people miss this. The point of the letter is for pastoral reasons, perhaps we could do a corrective baptism, don't you think, Bishop of Rome? I mean, that's I, that's the point. Is like, don't be so unfeeling. This guy's not even going to communion anymore. He's despairing. Right. So we should give him a corrective baptism. But it does show his first instinct is you don't need to correctly baptize this guy. The damage has been done. He's already got Christ's flesh and blood in him. Mm -hmm. um, you know, there's no need to really correct this at this juncture. Is his initial feeling? Yeah. And um, well, there's other there's know, other implications, Craig. Like, what if what if the guy he comes into the Eastern Orthodox Church and he's uh, he becomes a reader or a subdeacon, but now there's corrective baptism, so his orders need to get re or he needs. To and, get and, you know what I mean? Again, we're gonna go way off, but yes, I yeah. we I there's someone who I believe is a saint um, in my community, Archbishop uh, uh, Dimitri of Dallas. Hmm. And uh, if I skip his name, it's only because I, I've been awake since like 2.50 a.m. <laughs> that being said, um, you could Google his relics are like actually incorrupt, not like those fake incorrupt relics. Like literally years later, he didn't corrupt like at all. And it's hmm. on like mainstream news website. So it's hmm. uh, he's someone who I believe is a saint. But long story short, he came down very hard against corrective baptisms precisely for that reason, though, because hmm. he's like, 
What are people going to show up at church? Because there were priests getting corrected baptisms on Mount Athos. Like, are they going to show up to church and think that they were never really baptized and that you were never really a priest and they never really communed flesh and blood? Like, where do we go with this? Mm -hmm. um, and so I think there's a pastoral element that can't be ignored. I also would say the more laxity within the reception of converts to orthodoxy there is, maybe the more serious we got to go back in the other direction in order to correct it, right? Like you don't fix a bent branch by putting it back a little bit. You got to bend it back the other way and then, you know, graft it. You know what I mean? So um, so we see that, but it's, I do think from a vantage point of a clergyman, it can be extremely problematic and create major instability at the parish level. And I think a bishop would be in this right to say, no, we can't allow this now. You got to take one for the team and, and yeah. not do this despite your conscience because you're going to take a lot of people down with you if you do right. this. Right. And, and that's essentially what our job is. Yeah. I'm sorry? Economia, they call it. Yeah. And, and yeah. well, that's a bigger issue. Could he do something economic where there's actually no canonical grounds for granting economy? I, mm. You know, it's a bigger issue. But, but what I would say is the pastoral application in that instance is obvious, but in the other direction. I ultimately... Christ came to heal us, and so I don't think that means we willingly ignore the canons, but we can't use the canons as a way to bludgeon people and keep people outside of the kingdom of God either. There, there needs to be a sensible approach, but I'm going way beyond my purview. I'm just strictly saying my opinion. Sure. Okay. We we'll go back to the book. Um, you give two very important, uh, uh, I would say, you give a lot of, the space, a lot of time, important sections to uh, two Antiochian situations, at least more later, but two particular ones early on. Um, first with Paul of Samosata and then with Meletius. Um, can you get into those a little bit? Can you, like, sure. where, where does, what's the, what's the role of the papacy in either, in both of them? I'll try to be very brief with these. Uh, yeah. The Paul of Samosata issue is very important mm -hmm. because. Following up on Pope Cornelius becoming Pope and the Novation Schism, which was only like 20 years before, mm. Pope Cornelius sent encyclicals throughout the world asking for people to accept him as Pope, right? To so the other patriarchs. I, you know, I'm a, also a patriarch, essentially. And then their synods would choose whether they accepted that or not. Um, what we find with Paul Samosata is depositions work exactly the same way. You can't just like depose a guy single-handedly in a single jurisdiction. He's a patriarch. The mm -hmm. other patriarchs, it's like they have to, to be a patriarch, all the other patriarchs have to agree. Well, to not be a patriarch anymore, all the other patriarchs have to agree. Mm -hmm. And we don't have, a patriarchy is, a patriarchy is not five separate popes. A patriarch, uh, a patriarch, uh, Kate, is a patriarch with a synod. So that means the whole synod signs along with them. Mm -hmm. Um, and so simply with the Paul Samosata episode, we see he's deposed because the patriarchs of everywhere end up signing on on this. Um, Rome's role ultimately is that of putting the whipped cream or the cherry on the Sunday. <laughs> because, yeah, uh, Paul Samosata is deposed, but he refused to leave. <laughs> like, what do you what do you do? It's sort of like you and what army are going to make me stop. And eventually... Um, after the Palomarian Empire collapsed, it was like, yeah, the Roman army is going to make you stop. And they appealed to a pagan emperor. And so the pagan emperor said, okay, well, I'm going to let the synod in Rome choose. And so it's kind of this inauspicious beginning for an appeal made to Rome. Because before that, the appeals were made against Rome. And the baptism controversy was against Rome. In the uh, Pasca slash um, jurisdiction controversy, uh, with Ephesus, it was against Rome. Mm -hmm. But this is the first time it went to Rome, worth pointing out. But instead of automatically reading Vatican I, you have to realize uh, the Pomeranian Empire had occupied Alexandria, had opera, occupied Jerusalem, had occupied Antioch. They occupied most of Asia Minor. That means most of the synod that was Ephesian. And not to get too complicated, Ephesus and Caesarea competed for who was the patriarchate city there. Mm -hmm. um, ultimately, Caesarea won that. I don't know how, but it, so hence Rome didn't find them dependable because most of their synod was recently under foreign control. So, what was the only synod not under foreign control? Rome. So it's an obvious choice. You don't have to 
get to you know Vatican One in order to see where this went. Um, to do it to address the Miletian schism um, in the late fourth century, um, Saint Miletius of Antioch was a bishop that was uh, ordained by a synod. Oh, he real, real quick. Sure. So sorry, just to add right to on. the last thing before we leave it there. Also, I think the local synod of bishops in Antioch that was huge because they're the ones who deposed them in the first place. Rome is yes, approving with, it. Like there's a cherry on top. You know. Yes. Well, yeah. it's it's just to further specify because you're right for me to get more specific about this. Mm. The local Antiochian synod deposed Paul Samosata with legates from Asia Minor and legates from Jerusalem meaning three patriarchates deposed them within that local synod. It wasn't just like they did it all alone. Alexander synod wrote, was in there? Yes, they were, they, were, they were represented as well. Yeah. And Denisius of Alexandria himself was part of one of the earlier synods. He didn't live the 268, if I remember right. Mm -hmm. But um, he was in the synod in 264. So, um, and same with St. Fermilion, he was in the earlier synod. So it's like, you know, you have like kind of like these heavy hitters who are also part of it, but it was an evolving situation. Mm. That synod in 268 wrote letters to Alexandria and to Rome to receive it because they already had three synods receiving it at that juncture. Right. So it's clearly in the sources. It's not that's something I'm making up. We will get into that more when we get to Ephesus. Um, ever so briefly with the Malaysian schism, um, the Patriarch of Antioch initially did not at least sign a, uh, a Nicene um, confession. This led to um, Rome, who was strongly Nicene, rightly um, not recognizing him, but wrongly allowing a bishop who was in, um, what's it called, exile, who was particularly um, Lucifer Calieri, to ordain um, a bishop single-handedly, which is not canonical, and that was Paulinus yeah. of Antioch. Long story short, um, Malatius has recognition from all church because he has a canonical um, ordination. Paulinus does not. Um, a deal is kind of cut where, all right, whoever lives longer will get to be the real bishop. Um, everyone signs on to the deal, but then the side of Malatius, his successor Flav uh, Flavian, does breaks the deal, <laughs> which makes Rome unhappy. So Rome then goes back into schism over it. Mm -hmm. so, again, not for no reason, right? I'm not pulling any punches it's because yeah. they broke the deal. Yeah, and just um, so the viewers, the viewers have context, uh, the, what the era of history Craig is talking about here, this is when the Arians tried to jack hijack uh, um, the Sea of Antioch earlier. In, in the century. So this was when the Council of Nicaea was hap happened and the Council, the Council of Constantinople was coming up or had happened also, also I think. Um, and then uh, 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 Eustathius of Antioch was the Nicene uh, patriarch uh, when Nicaea happened. So when the Arians um, hijacked the sea, uh, Rome was making the argument that Paulinus was the successor in that line. Of Eustathius because and of the Craig, same doctrine, yeah. yeah. And Craig is picking up from there. No, again, he was uh, Paulina in reality had a uh, was a joke, mm. um, not because maybe he was considered a holy man, but I mean, ecclesiastically, he was a joke. He had only one church building, he had no synod, um, and so he couldn't really have a serious claim of the to succession. And uh, so, long story short, everyone recognized um, Flavian ultimately, including Alexandria, including people within Rome's own patriarchate, um, like those in Illyricum. And ultimately, only Rome was the only one not recognizing. While well, even people within their own patriarchate recognized uh, Saint Flavian. What What and about Alexandria? Including Alexandria, because the Synod in Constable three ninety four. Um, the Patriarch Alexandria, Theophilus, was there with uh, Flavian, mm -hmm. and they decreed together. So it's uh, they already accepted it, and also during Constable One, um, there's a Nicene code canonized by everybody today, and yeah. I don't think Paulinus is. No, which yeah. which shows you the side that's right is obviously the one that's the same. <laughs> yeah. 
So, like, uh, Alexandria wasn't happy because, again, they were part of the same deal that Malatia's side, which became Flavian, broke. But at the end of the day is the whole church disagreed with Rome and Rome relented in the end of the day. Yeah. That's what happened. You know, um, there, there was later uh, schisms, which I the book doesn't talk about other than in a footnote, where Rome recognized St. John Chrysostom and initially St. Cyril of Alexandria didn't. Mm -hmm. That created a schism. And uh, eventually, um, Alexandria accepted St. John Chrysostom as a saint. Um, we have a hagiography where uh, St. John Chrysostom appeared in a dream and they reconciled. Um, and so Rome broke in out of communion with a lot of different people over questions, sometimes justifiable questions. Mm -hmm. But at the end of the day, um, Paulinus' line was non-canonical. No one recognized it, and Rome relented. And that's the real history of it. And so, so when, it, so when I just oh, one last point before I forget. Yeah. So when apologists say, you know, when was there ever tangential communion in of uh, the history of Christianity? It's like the play in the all the time. Yeah, yeah, like in what's called the Malaysian schism, which is really the Roman schism. So they were the only ones going to schism at a certain point. Everyone was in communion, including Rome was a communion with Alexandria and the Lyricum, but they were not communion with Antioch, who those guys were in communion with. Yeah. This is mainstream stuff that happens all the time. Happened in the Crusades, by the way. Right. So it's like it's it's kind of like it's one of those things that are brought up, but it's absurdly historically ignorant. Yeah, and and you brought up uh, Cyril and and Chrysostom. I wasn't going to get into it, but you reminded me. So uh, Cyril and Chrysostom. Then in this case, and all the cases we're talking about, whenever whenever there is. A situation where Rome is not in communion with someone is that an indication of there is that person is not or that uh, church or or whatever is not in communion with the whole Catholic Church because they're oh. not in communion with Rome. No, and then how do you address that in your book? Okay, it's well in, in short. Um, what churches could do is they could recognize what their church thinks is is right or wrong, what their church is in communion with. Yeah. Right. So, like, I call it a local excommunication because that's really what it is, right? Like, they were in communion with Antioch, but the reality is they're communion with someone who's communion with Antioch. Right. Right. It wasn't a full blown schism. Yes. Um, and we see the same thing with um, with appeals. Appeals just didn't go to Rome, by the way. So all an appeal was is you would find yourself in communion with someone mm. and they would recognize your communion or you would appeal your deposition, right? And they'd say, well, we don't recognize your deposition. We still see you as a clergyman and we'll still serve liturgy with you, right? right? Um, this happens all the time. And uh, maybe it's a good time to get into Ephesus. This is explicitly drawn out during Ephesus. Um, where really all that St. Pope Celestine did was excommunicate locally, um, excommunicate locally the uh, um, Nestorius, and ultimately speaking, he even recognized Nestorius with his uh, Episcopal ti uh, title until there was a pan patriarchal deposition in an ecumenical council, because ultimately that's the only binding decision, it's a no single patriarchate. Can make a binding decision for the whole church. They can only make a decision for their own locality. Let's do it. Let's get into let's get into Ephesus. So, so Cyril, Cyril, right? Um, you know, everyone knows Cyril and Nestorius. They're writing letters back and forth. Cyril writes a letter to Celestine, uh, but he he writes letters to him. He's smart enough to translate them into Latin before sending them. Nestorius doesn't do that. He just sends them in in. Greek and then the Pope can oh. plan whatever he wants. Yeah. So um now when Pope Celestine gives the ultimatum to, to Nestorius, there's two questions. First question is does Cyril appeal to Celestine? Is this an appeal? Absolutely and, not. Okay. <laughs> you can go ahead and expand before I get to this. I mean Cyril is about to act. And what Cyril's doing, he's looking for allies. Mm. Now, we, we've had whole episodes where uh, we get into, in reality, Cyril's being beyond patient with the story. So I, I'm just not, I'm not going to get into any of this. I'm just going to speak very frankly, and you guys can get into that if you want all the nitty-gritty and emphasis on, on, on that. 
But long story short, Servo was aware if he excommunicates Nestorius, he's in the capital of empire. So the only way to really counteract the power of Nestorius is to make a pan patriarchal um, deposition of Nestorius, which is why in his letter to Celestine, he says to Celestine, we're going to do it. Um, the Macedonian bishops are on our side. The whole world's on our side. We, essentially, will you join our side? Mm. And uh, Celestine see which way which way the wind's blowing, and he essentially gets on board with it. Yeah. So in the case of in the case of uh, Cyril writing to Celestine and Celestine replying, now a, a lot is made out of. Well, look at how Cyril's talking to Celestine. Look how he says to him, I wouldn't dare to excommunicate him without you. Um, things like this. How do you kind of view that in the context of everything? Well, for one, you're, if you're trying to get someone to agree with you, you're not going to say, I'm going to do it whether you agree with it or not. <laughs> but you might do that after they say no. And then you might say, all right, well, whether you agree or not, I'm going to do it. So are you going to argue on board or no? So, like, I mean, that come on, man. That's common sense. Okay. Um, we also have in Celestine's letter, I'm trying to remember who, I think it's his letter to, um, to, um, to John of uh, Antioch. Yeah. And um, long story short, he writes to him that, um, I wish I had the quote in front of me right now. Um, when he writes to him, he pretty much says that, um, Da, 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 da. I'm trying to. I'm going to have to just speak very broadly. When he sure. writes right to the clerk, when he writes right to the story, he says you're excommunicated from the Catholic Church. Mm -hmm. When he writes to other patriarchs, right, that he's not trying to fight with, he's trying to get to get on the same side that he's with Cyril. He right. says essentially saying we are excommunicated, right? Yeah. And so what people misunderstand is the tone in one letter because the context versus the tone in a different letter with a different context. Mm -hmm. Um. You know, and so I think that's something people really need to pay attention to is when he writes to other patriarchs, he doesn't pretend to speak to the whole church. Only when he writes to Nestorius and to his suffragan clergy. Um, does he speak that absolutely? We know this interpretation is correct because when Cyril writes to um to the bishops uh, uh juvenile and to and he writes to Antioch, Cyril says that Celestine excommunicated. Uh, the story is from the whole West. So he even mm. flat out gives where this excommunication is, not me making it up, right in Cyril's letter. That same statement is made in a letter from uh, St. Theod Theodosius the Younger, and it's said in passing during the council itself, in the right. conciliar minutes. So yeah. this comes up in every single context you could want to find it. Um, and so to read just one thing, in a very particular context where you're trying to get uh, the Pope on your side, um, just like is and and jump to that conclusion against all this other explicit evidence to me just is a historical. Okay. And then when Sir, when Celestine is writing to uh, get, he gives the ultimatum to Nestorius. You have two weeks, uh, you know. Yeah. Um, now that is an ultimatum of universal excommunication from the entire church? Well, he speaks as such because yeah. he's writing, presuming that Alexander is also excommunicated. Right. Um, and again, like I said, this letter is straight to Nestorius. Mm -hmm. Now, the belief facts rather than words, we have a follow-up letter between Cyril and Celestine, and Celestine writes back to Cyril that Nestorius will still be recognized as a bishop. Mm -hmm. So clearly he didn't see his excommunication as final. I mean, right. that's that that's right from Celestine. The yeah. council had to put into effect that excommunication. In fact, that's precisely what the council says. We have put into effect Celestine's excommunication. It's like a direct quote from the council. Right. So we see this in the letters. It's an interpretation of the letter that makes sense. And it's explicitly said in the council, which gives us the interpretation. Okay. Is there anything? Uh, oh, and then the Philip, Philip the legate at, at Ephesus. Yeah, I don't know. It's forgive me for the lack of patience with the these sort of really bad readings of Ephesus. It's like if you read the back and forth in Ephesus, there there's not this claim to this papal charism. Hmm. Um, what's going on here? Long story short, 
The story is just opposed on June 22nd. Right. My birthday. The the papal legates weren't there yet. The authority, which the council arrogates to themselves, because again, to excommunicate a patriarch, you need all the patriarchs on board, otherwise, other than of course the one being excommunicated, right? Like they don't need to excommunicate themselves. Let's, mm -hmm. let's be real, guys. Um is that Rome's on board because of Celestine's letter, right? right? They said, look, well, this letter shows they already accepted this, right? And Cyril's like, and I'm the legate of Rome. He even identifies himself as such, right? So Rome's represented through me, and here is Celestine's letter. Um, or, or word of Celestine's excommunication, essentially, because then the letter is read out during when the Roman legates come. So that being said, the Roman legates come late, and they are angry that they're left out because when did this happen before in Constantinople one, mm. right? That's Which, true. as the church, as the sh book shows, they accepted Canon three. Um, they have received official correspondence against the Palatine Creed. Um, their their canons were used during Chalcedon. They accepted Constantinople one. All right, it's it's kind of this revisionism that they did. There's really no primary source evidence contrary to the fact that they receive console for one but what they didn't want was like this barely any sort of representation in console for one only saint escolius of thessalonica represented the whole west mm. and so um and that was an issue during concept one because Con rome at that time didn't accept the new patriarch of constantinople itself right there's a whole separate debate other than on the night on uh, nicene christology over do we accept Maximus the Cynic as the Bishop of Constantinople? I won't get into those details, but that's why Rome was kind of unhappy they were kept out of the loop because they wanted a say on who is patriarch. Because again, patriarchs must receive patriarchs. It's pretty understandable. Right. Right. So the Roman legates in Ephesus, to go back to Ephesus, aren't happy that they weren't allowed to get the word in edgewise. And they act very unhappy about it. So this, this whole posturing is because of them not being given the time of day um, during the original council, that there wasn't delayed for them. Now, the stance of the council, so that way nothing be called to question, was that the, de the deposition of Storius was already effective, right? That's their stance. And so the back and forth isn't over papal supremacy. It's over getting the legates to accept that the council on June 22nd was canonical and that the deposition was final. Right. Right, just read the minutes. Papal sounding stuff. They don't respond with "We don't accept Vatican One." They respond with "Do you put into effect the deposition? Do you receive the deposition? Do you do you accept that this was canonical?" And the answer the Roman legates give is yes. Mm -hmm. So the debate is over the canonicity of the deposition of Storius on June twenty second. Has nothing to do with papal supremacy. Yeah. Um, I challenge anyone to read the conversation. And not just read what the legate says. Read the response, because the response is shows you how it's understood. So, like, for example, if I go, uh, Subdeacon, your show is really bad ASS, mm -hmm. right? And you go, oh, thanks, man. <laughs> Am I saying it's really bad? No. No, I'm saying it's good. And your response yeah. shows the context of how they interpret what was stated. Yeah. I mean, I hate to say, to say something that is uh, – not becoming of a Christian, but I'm, I just don't know how to throw this in people's faces. Like this is everyday language. It's how so language works. There's, you can there's interpret a, documents differently. Yeah, though. there's a good comment here saying, ask Craig. So when St. Basil talks about St. Meletius to St. Athanasius, right? Yeah. He, he talks about him in, I would argue, a stronger even way than what Philip says about the, the Pope of Rome. Yeah, That's but no one takes it that way. Yeah. Right? It's So it's like, there's a schizophrenic thinking on the Western, and this includes Eastern Orthodox in the West, Protestants, Roman Catholics, anyone reading in English, that whenever it's about the Pope of Rome, because it's a it's an institution in the West that's, you know, it's like the King of England, everyone cares when, you know, they change a Pope and all that stuff, that they see it about the Pope, it matters more than when you see the exact same words about someone else. Yeah. Right? So when Ephesus 2 calls um the oscars a, a personage unique in the whole world ecumenical patriarch right like no one which means universal bishop right mm -hmm. that's what they're calling him mm -hmm. you know no one takes that to mean that somehow he's he was like the pope you know what how the pope um, thinks of it today yeah <laughs> and so it's 
I have a list. I have a, I call it an Orthodox papal quote mine. You could Google it, where I actually make a list of all the honorifics about people aren't the Pope of Rome with these outrageous statements, it, you know, including the, their alleged infallibility and stuff like that. And all I can tell you is if you have to be schizophrenic in interpreting the sources, then the, the interpretation you're given is not right. There yeah. has to be a consistent threat. Right. And so what I offer here is the immediate context of how they are talking to one another. How does mm -hmm. the conversation start? And how do people respond to each statement? Sure. I, I mean, I and, always... And then we have a clear basis of what's really going on. Yeah, I always say, I don't know how familiar you are, Craig, with this. So um, I didn't see it in the book, but... Uh, the Church of the East uh, Synod 424. Um, yes, yeah. The yeah. Uh, the Dojo the or... Yeah, that's yeah. right. Um, and I always say there, if the, if the Church of Rome had any such synod, they wouldn't let us hear the end of it. Um, if they had a synod that, speaking that highly of their patriarch, man... We'd have we it would be on the forefront every day in the conversations. The Church of the East has a synod saying he is uh Peter, our patriarch is Peter. No one you cannot appeal to any other patriarch against him. No one can judge him, only God can judge him, even the synod can't depose him. All these things that they don't even follow, really, because they can depose their patriarch, they can they believe their patriarch can be deposed, whatever. But they're saying all this stuff in the synod. And it's super early. It's 424. Everyone's yeah. still in, in communion, you know. Um, uh, and the, the, the Latins don't have such a synod like this. So if they had it, imagine what they would do. Um, but it's, yeah, I'm, yeah, go ahead. Yeah, it's a, it's a double standard in the sources. And right. we have to look holistically at these things. Um, and so it's you have to look at what does this mean everywhere else? And what did people do, right? They put their money where their mouth is. What they do shows you how to interpret their words. Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, is there anything else you want to get into during, like, in the early 5th century stuff? Or should we now get into the part, the divergence? We're at an hour 30. Yeah, I mean, I, I guess we could get into Chalcedon. If people follow questions on Ephesus, that's fine. Or I can look more stuff up about precisely, like, if people want exact verbiage. But like I really I commend people read the book. It has the minutes of the council. You can follow the citations and read them yourself. I heard Ephesus is out in paperback now, or it's going to be out in paperback real soon. Nice. And so like you know you could follow up yourself. Beautiful. Sounds good. Um, yeah, like Craig said, check out the book. But I tell you guys every show I'm on, I tell you guys guys read the minutes of your councils that you believe are inspired by the Holy Spirit. Ephesus, Council, whatever councils your church follows, go read the minutes of your council. Don't let other people tell you what your councils say. Um, okay, so for the Tome of, of Leo of Rome, we're not going to, I mean, unless you want to, uh, we don't have to get into the Christology of the thing. That's not No, I don't want to. Yeah. I don't, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> we got episodes uh, in it. Yeah, that's fine. Um, so it was written, and correct me if I'm wrong on the year, 449. Uh, and it was written in regard in, in response to the home synod in, that happened in 448 in Constantinople, where Flavian of Constantinople deposes Eutyches. Everybody uh, writes to Leo about it. Eutyches writes to Leo. Flavian writes to Leo. Everyone's writing to Leo. Leo then responds with the tome. It is kind of like the de facto, the judgment of what happened, what they should do with Eutyches. And that is the implication of, it seemed like from his reaction, like you said, judging from his reaction, the tome is, is either you accept it or he excommunicates whoever doesn't accept it. So before that, Leo, when he comes into the papacy, he writes a letter to Dioscoros. So this is, uh, sorry, when Dioscoros comes into his papacy, Leo, Leo writes the letter to him because Leo came into the Roman papacy before Dioscoros came into the Alexandrian papacy, I think by four years or so. Yeah. Um, so Leo writes to Dioscoros. He tells him when and when not to ordain priests. 
don't ordain on Saturdays or ordain, like I don't remember exactly what the detail was. Yeah, you know, Roman customs vis a vis Eastern customs. Yeah, and and uh, you know, it's strange if you're an Eastern Christian, whether you're EO or OO, it's strange when uh, another patriarch is writing to you when and when not to ordain people or some these minor micromanaging things because you don't see it in church history. I don't think there's precedent for that. Now, the, is that taken into account with how Leo reacts to the acceptance of the tome or lack thereof? Well, we see that, for example, in earlier errors, Dionysius of Alexandria, for example, wrote the Rome on his teaching and baptism. Mm -hmm. um, we know that um, Rome, like First Clement, which was an encyclical, um, we know from St. Ignatius that he said Roman joins others and he say teach others. They get their letters. We know from Dionysius of Corinth, a different Dionysius, yet again, that they receive letters from Rome. They take them as teaching. So it's not unprecedented for a patriarch even write to other patriarchs with a teaching. Okay. Um, and so when there's not a dispute in that teaching, um, then it's not like a take it or leave it thing. Um, and so being that the... Uh, writing the Oscars about the uh, Easter dating and all that stuff. Um, it wasn't like a, a – and guys, not over it being on Saturday. It was kind of like, you know, they've got Pascalions and they compute these things. Um, it wasn't like a, a take it or leave it, but it was meant to kind of stir the pot. All right. You know, this was political. He's like poking at him. He's poking at him. Yeah. Um, but it's, I would put it below the tome and more and similar to what we saw earlier. Like it, sure. it wasn't like you accept this or we don't mm -hmm. accept you. It's just sort of like, right. this is what we recommend. Right. Yeah. And that, that does have precedent. Yeah. Um, the tome itself is essentially like, yeah, it's Leo's tome, but we have to see, this is the Roman synod saying, this is our Christology. Right. Mm -hmm. So when Ephesus two is being held to make, to pretty much determine the definitive Christology of the East. Right. Cause what's the only thing above the can Constantinople home synod, Right. Uh, an Eastern Synod where you get all the Eastern Synods together, right? Yeah. yeah. So the, I think that's why the tone was what it was, right? Because, all right, we can't be there. We can't argue with you this case. So here's our case. You could go read it pretty right. much. Right. Um, and the fact that it was not read, which is that there's an interesting back and forth why it wasn't, because both the Oscars and Juvenal kind of make apology for it. Because and it, think about a real ecumenical council, no offense, but we could disagree. But in a real ecumenical council, every patriarch's got to have a say. You know, um, that's why even if you're under trial, you have the ability to speak back unless you don't answer a summons. Yeah. Right. So, like, it's this is one of the bizarre, in my opinion, we have a whole show on this canonical irregularities in Ephesus 2 amongst others. Um, so, but that being said, I don't see then the tome within the context of it being this absolute ultimatum, which again feeds into Vatican I stuff. But also feeds into the, no offense, but maybe the Oriental Orthodox view of things of that they're being kind of thrown to the wall saying, accept this or else. I see this sort of in the middle. That This was something no, that... Yeah. Can, I agree that, with you. I, okay. I, I don't, oh, yeah. I'm just speculating. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> so yeah. Then, I, yeah. I, don't think, I don't think Ephesus 2 viewed it in an all or nothing kind of way either. And that's why Ephesus 2 doesn't read the tome and doesn't condemn the tome. It could have yes. condemned it, and it doesn't do with that either. Yeah, the, is, Leo wasn't um, Leo wasn't communicated. He wasn't excommunicated or anything. No. Um, and so in Chalcedon, the tome comes up because, like, all right, now we're having an ecumenical council. Theoretically, no, you don't accept it. We're attempting, I'll just say, I'll be neutral. We're attempting an ecumenical council. Now we got to get everyone saying in here. Now, to be fair to your side, they essentially took the Egyptian synod put them under house arrest in Alexandria and Constantinople and said, we're not going to let you leave until you sign on this. Mm. Literally, right? They actually tried compelling them to appoint a new patriarch of Alexandria. And long story short, they're like, no, because if we do that here, we're going to get killed when we go back home. They're going to murder right. us. Right. And they said, so if you're going to do it, you might as well murder us here so we get murdered back at home. And that yeah. apparently shamed um, St. Marcion into letting them sign into Chalcedon, but not appoint a new patriarch until they went back to Egypt, which, mm -hmm. of course, um, there was imperial meddling and 
I'm, I won't get more to that. There's a pure metal in everything once you get to this point in history. Your mind will go crazy if you oh, sure. think almost too hard about it. But so that being said, so the tone doesn't take this all or nothing tone in Calcine. And it's one of many things that have to be considered now, especially because it was like kind of the 800 pound gorilla in the room that was ignored during Ephesus 2. Like now we can't ignore it. And so the tome is red. Um, the overall tone of Chalcedon is like, whatever, all right, I accept it. We already said we're, we're going to interpret it our own way. Let's move on with it. Um, and when it keeps getting pushed, it starts getting pushed back even against the tome itself. Um, the Illyrians and the, um, the Egyptians pretty much start pushing back and, and calling uh, the Egyptians and the, or, and the, they call them Orientals, but they would have been the Antiochians, um, the Storians. Mm -hmm. And so you have this open debate during Chalcedon where they're pretty much saying, oh, well, you know, if we're going to bring, if you want to bring the council back to Rome, you're an historian. Because they were pretty much laying bare. They found that they would accept the tone, but they're not going to accept, um, essentially, Leo dictating everything. Was, mm -hmm. if you read the fourth session, or that's the fifth session, the debate there. So what's the relevance to this, the papacy? I It's actually... The tome itself is the last thing I discussed because I consider it actually the least important thing ecclesiastically. There's not too much importance that you could attach to it. Um, you could disagree with it dogmatically, but the tome wasn't foisted as some sort of papal direct jurisdiction or papal infallibility thing. It's just it was one amongst other documents that were accepted as canonical um, during this council. Um, rightly or wrongly, I'm not, I'm not trying to weigh in on that. I'm, I'm speaking as historian as what the ecclesiastical ramifications of this document are. If anything, it works against the Roman view because it was under debate, which is unthinkable if the Pope has the final say, if the Pope is infallibility, if anyone even conceives of such a thing. Um, and actually, in a sense, it's kind of cloaked with the uh, accusation of heresy in that they're called historians um, for trying to bring the council back to Rome. So this to me works against modern Roman uh, presuppositions. But the more interesting stuff, which I don't have a lot of time to get into the detail right now, is during Chalcedon, we actually have a statement that's in all the Greek and all the Latin minutes where they speak of Rome giving judgment with the whole church together with Peter. And so it kind of speaks of the work of the council as Petri, right? Like we spoke about in the beginning that Peter, everyone's successor of Peter. We also have other passing statements where, like, they call Peter of Corinth Peter and stuff like that. So it's not just the Pope of Rome called Peter, like we see in a lot of papal quote minds when the Pope is called Peter and he spoke for Peter and stuff like that. We see other people called by the same um, same name. Um, but what's interesting about this is we have a letter from Leo. It's letter 103 where it's actually altered, so it reads differently than the Greek and Latin minutes of Chalcedon. I get to very specific textual reasons why letter 103 is not the actual rendering of Chalcedon itself. Mm -hmm. um, letter 103 gives a rendering which really isn't super controversial in subsequent East-West relations, um, but it's controversial in light of Canon 28 because it states that the Bishop of Rome has a Petrine inheritance. Mm -hmm. Right. And you go, well, that's sort of obvious. Well, why is this important? Because Rome no longer since um, the um, Attila the Hun and the siege of essentially the almost siege of Rome realizes that they're not going to be a political powerhouse anymore. Being the being old Rome, when the Roman Empire is collapsing, has no cachet. And so you need to now put all your cachet uh, among an another sort of uh, rationalization. And that traditional rationalization of Peter's relics is stronger now than the political rationalization. Um, but that siege didn't occur in 451. It occurred in 453 when letter 103 was written. Mm -hmm. And so we see that what is in the actual um, minutes, I argue, is altered in letter 103 because we don't find it in the Greek minutes. We don't find it in any of the Latin translations. The scholars sites because they were um they were translating the Greek minutes, which were supposedly altered. But consider one other thing. Who is the only chancery, meaning the only people writing for a certain patriarchate, 
caught with a forgery during Chalcedon. It was specifically the um, Roman Patriarchy. In the 16th session, they quote Canon 6 and Nicaea, and it's forged. Hmm. So it's not me like, oh, you know, I'm this accusing Roman forgery. They actually use forgery, and they're caught red-handed in session 16 to counter Canon 28 of that council. Hmm. Right? So why wouldn't they use forgery again after that council? When they, for the same reason, to kind of discount this universal Petrian inheritance, because if they don't have this exclusive sort of claim, then the only thing that gives them primacy ultimately is the political status of old Rome, and that's going by the wayside in 453. So it's a very interesting detail. Um, it's been ignored by uh, Price and Gaddis. Um, mm -hmm. So I consider what my book puts forward and real advance on this issue. I, of course, I offer citations to Manzi. So for people want to look at the Greek and Latin, they can look at that and to letter 103 so they can see it themselves. Okay. Uh, yeah, that's, I'm, I have to go pay attention to um, session 16 now regarding that. That's amazing. I didn't even, I didn't even notice I that. I mean, you know, again, St. Leo's my saint. Um, and you could like not blame him, I suppose, because he wasn't the one who did it. It was his legates. Yeah. But they quote a forgery. I mean, it's flat out there. And I make the argument that when they start reading canons and they start arguing over canons, um, the Greeks actually bring up the canons that they all use throughout the council because they're quoted in other sessions. Um, and they point out Canon 3 is within the book of canons that they were all using in all the other sessions. And so we see that there's been some doctrine on the Latin side to kind of cover this up. And the the Greek rendering the minutes is much more coherent. Okay. So a few things. Would you say that it helps your case and your book's case to um, – so the – for for in our understanding, Ephesus two. Why would the tome be read? Let's put Christology on the side. Why would the tome be read if it is a judgment of the case of a trial that hadn't happened yet? It's like the the ultimatum of Celestine being effect in effect before the council. It's so, sort of like reading Cyril's third letter in Ephesus. Yes. Right. The exactly. stories was right. The stories was still under. Uh, again, I don't view that as a concession, but that being said, right, the, the stories was still under trial, but they read a dogmatic letter which gave a judgment, right? And so, and that was Cyril having a say. Right. And so, in the same way, especially, especially in Leo's absence, I I think he had every canonical right to have his synodical statement read to communicate a say. Now, whether or not his legate would have then disowned it or compromised, whatever, right? This happens in ecumenical councils, but it's nothing nothing in Ephesus 2 that, that with that would have been any different than what already happened in Ephesus 1. Yeah. In any case, um, the emperor had set it up, as you know, St. Theodosius. Um, he had set it up to where the repentance... Uh, and exoneration of Eutyches was already uh, like a matter of fact. Like he, they, I don't even, I don't even think Eutyches wrote his own um, like confession of Orthodox confession of faith. I think they wrote it for him. You know, like they, it was set up for him to come out of that as exonerated. Yeah, by, it's it's a little off the beaten path, but I would agree. If you read Ephesus two, it's when you read when they receive Eutyches and accept them, like. I remember St. Juvenal is like, well, before I thought he was a heretic, but now that I hear his confession, I see that he's Orthodox. And it's sort of like rubber stamping, like, all right, yeah. there's a document. It says the right stuff, rubber stamp. And right. But I don't think so Leo, it really Leo's like tome, Leo's tome is not in the... Game. Yeah, it's yeah. not like the, it's not in the political game of this. Exactly. Um, uh, with, um, with Ephesus... With Ephesus and Chalcedon, um, regarding so we're saying so that I don't think, and correct me if I'm wrong, I don't think they're going to Ephesus thinking either you're going to accept uh, the the ultimatum of Celestine or the third letter of Cyril, or we're going to leave. 
I don't think they're going in there thinking that. I think no, they they thought it was these things were to be worked out and discussed. Yeah. Um, and I mean, I think that's one of the black guys against emphasis too, is there really wasn't that freedom of discussion. Um, and that's why Chalcedon to a fault, um, at least tries to portray a lot of freedom of discussion because it's meant as a corrective of emphasis too. Um, you know, it could be argued, well, how much could you do that while you're under house arrest, like the Egyptian Synod was, um, that's debatable, but at least they were allowed to vent their frustrations um and have it entered into the minutes. Um, so it's uh well Dioscoros Dioscoros was under house arrest on on one of the summons. He wasn't allowed to go. So uh, but for but the I'm second talking, one, I believe, yeah. Yeah. So I'm saying in Chalcedon, in Chalcedon, though, I think, and correct me if I'm wrong, I think it seems as though the Roman legates are there saying the tome is non-negotiable. You, it's not a matter of discussion. If you don't accept it, we're going to leave. Oh, I see where you're going with this. Yeah. I, I guess in short, when the Roman legates say either accept it or we go to Rome, and Martin's mm -hmm. like, yep, I'll send you to Rome. Right, mm -hmm. sort of like Rome will decide it. I don't see this as a papal infallibility, papal supremacy, papal anything sort of deal. I see this more as Marcion obviously had military control of Constantinople. Mm -hmm. um, he had the Alexandrian Synod where he wanted them. Um, and what he didn't have was control over the Western Roman Empire the way he wanted it. Because, right, there was a separate emperor. There were technically one empire. And so he had to kowtow a little more of Rome to get them to go along, right? Ephesus too flopped, right? It didn't it didn't make unity the east and made the west unhappy. So he's like, all right, I'm going to try to make more – think of it politically. I'm going to go with the side that makes more people happy so I'm in a better position, right? Mm -hmm. I think any emperor would want to do that. And so he sort of made the political judgment that, well, I can't really – put force of arms and compel the Western Synod, they'll just go right back into schism anyway. So I'm going to do this on my side because I could do something about it. And that's exactly what he did. And so my view of that is not so much the Pope decides things, but it's actually more Marcion decides things. It's sort of like, listen, I want communion with Rome because I can make communion with you anyway, and there's nothing you could do about it. Got right? It. And so, yeah, Rome, Rome, so Italy was the voluntarily part. accept this. Are we going to make this so difficult for you that you'll mm -hmm. have to go to Rome and all this stuff um, that you're going to end up accepting it anyway? So you want to do this the easy way or you want to do this the hard way? And that's essentially the ultimatum he gives, um, which is precisely why it's the imperial representatives in the fifth session that pretty much um, pose. They, they're the ones who get the conversation going and, and, they, and they, they're even the ones that Pose making the um, the decree of the council and the sort of wording that it has to include, which interesting includes words from Dioscorus, because I think the purposeful intent was to try to compromise with Dioscorus partisans, so that way they could hopefully you know get Rome on board, but also as much as other people under their thumb on board as well. From a political perspective, whether you think it was authentically done or not. That's kind of an outside debate than the ecclesiastical debate we're having right now. Sure, sure. Um, and so that being said, within context, it's just it's not about Leo dictating terms. It's just not what occurred. You, you could argue Marcion was dictating terms. And from the Eastern Orthodox perspective, we'd see that as something God ordained to to bring out the best of what all these bishops were discerning and, you know, and to put the gold ribbon on it, so to say. Yeah. Um, but but if in a cold historical analysis, obviously that was the political machination given. Yeah, yeah. Um, and then going into, I think I within the within twenty years of the council, the Eastern Seas for the most part revert to be to not accepting Chalcedon. Rome then cuts them off again, um, and then you have. Uh, Zeno's Hinoticon, who that tries to solve solve everything. Rome doesn't sign off on that. So how does that play a role? I kind of thought of. Right. Mm -hmm. There actually was a Hinoticon leading faction in Rome. Mm -hmm. I wouldn't call them full-blown sellouts. They That's sort right. of just right. wanted tangential yeah. communion. So we saw mm -hmm. this in yeah. Pope Anastasius, who went to communion with Thessalonica. Right. Thessalonica was in communion with Alexandria, but there was no direct communion between um Alexandria and Rome. It was attempted. There was some correspondence on this. Um, 
The next, uh, I would argue Pope, because the actual city of Rome accepted him as Pope, um, was Laurentius. And the anti-Pope was Pope Symmachus. But Pope Symmachus, Christologically, from my perspective, was on the correct side. And Laurentius had the Anastasian policy, of Pope Anastasius, of tangential communion and accepting Hanatica. And so for, I do the math, it's something like 40% of the actual, they call it um, the Acacian schism for 40% of it. Mm -hmm. Rome was actually in communion with the Nazi bishops, right? Oh. So, it's, so it's like, it's more than people think, but it's tangentially. It wasn't mm -hmm. direct, right? Got it. Um, and just so people are aware, there was bishops at Antioch um, and Jerusalem that accepted Chalcedon, they're Chalcedonian, but they also accepted the Hinatica. Mm. Um, and so you kind of have this sort of broader view in the East and less exclusive view. And what this really comes down to is Rome from the Eastern Orthodox at the Oriental Orthodox perspective were the purists in this time, right? They were the purists. They refused the compromise on Chalcedon in any sort of way. Mm -hmm. um, and the whole point of the Hinaticon was we could compromise a little bit. We could accept Chalcedon's canons because that's what Constantinople wanted at the end of the day, right? They wanted that canon 28. So we yeah. could accept we could accept Chalcedon's canons. We could accept that uh, Chalcedon's correct, um, but we're not going to compel people that don't want to to sign on to it right. sort of deal. Right, right. Um, and Rome's like, you can't do that with an ecumenical council. So obviously I'm sy sympathetic to that. But this kind of leads into the whole formula hermistas thing, because I think this is like the, yeah. the biggest bullet for Eric Yabara and the whole Roman Catholic uh, apologist. Yeah. And I think they stole it from you. Because <laughs> <laughs> I, if I remember right, it was you saying to Eric Yabara years ago, you're like, listen, you know, the whole East accepts the Hematicon. And to get people to go against it, they had to swear this fealty to the Pope. And so you kind of see this Eastern Orthodox submission to the Pope in a way that's inconsistent with Orthodox ecclesiology. And you use this as an apologetic against both Eastern Orthodox and Rome to mm -hmm. demonstrate that that's why they're on the wrong side, because they forfeited their own ecclesiology. Mm. Um, now, I, you might have evolved on this. It's just interesting that you might have kind of started a ball rolling inadvertently. I didn't, I didn't know they didn't know. I thought they knew. Uh, but I think, and, and maybe uh, you have to reading this agree, mm -hmm. there's really more to this um, because Rome had this purest view, and among this purest of view was you can't commemorate those who have died that were Hanatikan leaning bishops. Mm -hmm. Because, right, if you do that, you're essentially accepting, you could be a saint and accept the Hanatikan. Yeah. Right. And so that was that purest view. And why can't you have that? Because they didn't want tangential communion. Remember, Laurentius didn't win. Symmachus win. Yeah. Hormistas was one of the deacons for Pope Symmachus, right? right? So it's just a continuation of Symmachus' policy. Exactly. And so they decide, all right, we're, um, we want communion with the East. So they make this formula Hormistas, and... The West accepts it, and those who were Chalcedonian in the East and not on the Hinatigan, like these uh, Syrian monks, also accepted it. But apparently, they, because we have the letter to the Syrian monks, they didn't think that like you actually had to add, agree to it ad verbatim. They understood the purpose of it. The purpose was to accept Chalcedon and not to accept the Hinatigan. Mm -hmm. That's precisely what they write back. They have honorifics. They're a little different. Um, they even write that what they wrote back was a formula. You don't right. read this English translation. I include the Latin in the book so you can see it yourself. This is something pointed out to me um, by John Calarapi, for example. Um, and so they even said their letter is the power of formulas. Um, and so we see the formula hermistas wasn't meant to be an ad verbatim thing that was accepted. What they wanted was Chalcedon and no Hinatica. That was the whole point. Um, this sort of ecclesiastical stuff is this later apologetic that even Anglicans bought into. And it's just not true. So how do we know this? Well, eventually, Justin becomes the Byzantine emperor. He wants to get rid of the Hinatigan. He, he foresees a future conquest of Western Rome. Mm. And so he wants the Roman synod in communion with them. 
And so now he knows we not we have to accept this formula because that's already it's kind of like the tone, right? This is the basis of communion with Rome if you want to accept it. You're right. And the Hormistus writes a letter to his legates that says, listen, you you could compromise very minor things within this formula. Um, and you could also compromise not them, them not allowing not allowing them to uh, to commemorate their death, mm -hmm. right? So he reveals he's willing to almost accept Hanatigan on multiple levels as long as they officially denounce it. Mm. Now, to his surprise, and I'd say elation, um, they're like, "All right, we won't we won't uh, affirm Acacius as a saint. We'll 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 anathematize him like you demand." And that's way more than he thought he would he would get. Yeah. But apparently, um, Saint John II of Constantinople subscribes to the formula using the language of Canon Twenty Eight. So it's kind of to stuff it to Rome, right? So that's why they did that. And so what now happens is, all right, Constantinople's more political. They're willing to kind of say, you know. Who cares about our saints, right? Because if you're commemorating before and now you're not, you're kind of saying they're not a saint anymore. So they're dropping them from commemoration. But the other less political parts of Eastern Christendom are not so pliable. And Hormistas essentially says, well, make them pliable. And Justinian, who's writing for his uncle, says, we're trying our hardest, but it's not working. You're going to have to kind of compromise here. Or you're not going to have communion with Jerusalem, and no one dare not have communion with Jerusalem. Mm. He writes to Hormistas. So Hermistus writes a letter, I think it's 79, the Collectio Avalana. It's translated in full on my website if people want to Google it. And in short, that letter states that as long as you accept Chalcedon and you make that clear, we will accept you. And you could and you write your accept, you write your confession of Chalcedon, um, either to a letter to us or a letter to Constantinople. Mm. And why is this important? Because what you get is you're allowed to commemorate saints that accept the Hanatigon. In fact, we have several Chalcedonian saints, patriarchs of Antioch and Jerusalem. They're saints, but they accepted the Hanatigon. So at the end of the day, the whole idea that like you can't have Hanatigon in any shape or form, the whole Roman policy was done away with. So the real story of the formula Hermistas has nothing to do with ecclesiology. And has everything to do with the with ultimately they compromise in almost everything in order to get communion again. It's, like, it's actually uh, very the fascinating. End of Antioch, right? Yeah, Flavian the second of Antioch is canonized even by Rome, and he accepted the Henoticon. Yeah, it's. I'll add one more thing for any Roman Catholics that happen to be watching, which would be that if you look at the examples of Rome's unsullied faith. They don't mention the Arian controversy. It's just Ephesus and Chalcedon. Because the only thing that they're really laying claim to is that Chalcedon is correct and that Chalcedon is not historian. Right? That is their claim. Now, you could claim that conceptually it's historian, but none of them were positively making the claim we are historians. Right? I'm sure you agree to that. And so they're not making a claim towards infallibility. Um, another thing where I'm going to take issue with men's um, is that supposedly – that in anathematizing all these non-Roman patriarchs, they're trying to point that, well, the Roman patriarch was always right. But they also never anathematized a Jerusalem patriarch. So I think the, the sort of Roman-centric reading, that uh, ecclesiastical reading that Menz even gives, um, is just incorrect. It's not borne out in the actual source. And um, what page is it in my book? I forget. I, th I, think, he's, I think he's German Catholic, isn't he? Um. Men's? Whatever his religion is, it's kind of irrelevant. We go by the evidence, right? Right, right? In my book, I give the full formula, and I like I embolden all the Christological parts, and I underline all the ecclesiastical parts. And it's really obvious this thing's not about an ecclesiastical claim. It's about a Christological claim. Right. And for the Oriental Orthodox, it's the wrong one. It's What do you mean? Well, because it's Chalcedonian, right? Oh, so oh. the the whole point of the formula Hermistas ultimately is a firm Chalcedon, right. and so it's it's not it's not about papal infallibility in the sixth century. It's that is a, a severe anachronism. Right, right, right. Um, uh, and are you familiar with uh, the role of the papacy in the Synod of five thirty six Constantinople? 
Yeah, I, I covered very short. This is one of those like almost, uh, I don't know, overly exaggerated events in history. He was just one bishop that among other bishops, the Constantinopolitan Synod yeah. that deposed um, the current bishop of Constantinople. Some say that he actually resigned, but then at least ordained a new bishop of Constantinople. We have the consecration letter, so he didn't do it single-handedly. It wasn't like the Pope acted in isolation. Yeah. Right? So let's just make it straight. The Pope and the Constantinopolitan Synod of bishops, all those bishops made a new bishop of Constantinople. It mm -hmm. wasn't just Rome doing it alone. Because you need the acceptance of all the patriarchs, Antioch's patriarch accepted it. And so did Jerusalem's patriarch where they held us in it. Hmm. We know this because uh, I forget which historian, but we, we have all these details. The only one um, who didn't was Alexander because at that time, Theodosius Alexander wasn't the real patriarch to the Chalcedonians. Mm -hmm. And they didn't have a Chalcedonian patriarch to the next year. So the point is what happened in 536 was has nothing to do with Petrin or, or papal exceptionalism in, in any way, shape, or form. It's um, so you're saying you're it's saying crazy that that, to assume that, in my opinion, with the fact that all the other patriarchs, just like with Paul of San Masada, recognized the deposition and the acceptance of the new patriarch. So you're saying with the deposition of who was for us, Saint Anthemus, the deposition yeah. of Saint Anthemus by <laughs> uh, Agapetus of Rome wasn't single handed. He no. did it with the other Constantinopolitan bishops. Absolutely. That's what the extant sources show. We have the consecration letter. Got it. And, okay, we I want to cover two more <coughs> things before we wrap up. And these, these are these are some whoppers. So let's see. Let's see if we can, if we can squeeze them in, Craig. Uh, Vigilius and Pope Agatho's letter. Oh, uh, this... I didn't really prepare for this so much because okay. I, I figured it wouldn't More. be of interest to an Oriental Orthodox audience, but I'll just mm -hmm. say very briefly, yeah. um, Vigilius, he defended that the three chapters, which are condemned as heretical, were Orthodox. Mm -hmm. He taught that these theological treatises were Orthodox, mm -hmm. and he blamed Satan for deceiving him in the right. second in, uh, in his letter uh, to I forget who the, the subsequent bishop of Constantinople was. I think it was, might have been, was he Eutyches of Constantinople? He has a kind of interesting name, I forget. <laughs> um, um, but but that being said, it's, uh, so that's an episode where it's it's like it's a defeater episode. I have a video on it, uh, Vatican and Disproves in One Papacy, if people want to yeah. see it. But it's uh, it's covered in the book, of course, in detail with the sources, with the citations. Yeah. Um, with St. Agatho, I'll just say, this is one of those things where, if you read St. Agatho's own letter, he says it's the Orthodox faith that cannot fail, um, mm -hmm. that the Mother Church needs uh, essentially uh, help. And so he, that can't be Rome because that means Rome has her. Um, I also contextualize it where people understood how many infallibility statements were in the seventh century. They wouldn't see anything exceptional about that letter. They were calling po uh, the Emperor Heraclius um, infallible and the they were calling the Bishop of Constantinople the Bishop of the entire church and uh, and stuff like that. It's the there were outrageous um, honorifics in those times. And I think that might be even why the tone of Agatha's letter was what it was. It was sort of as a corrective against those other honorifics. Got it. Got it. Okay. And they're they're both covered in the book in detail. He gave us a lot of spoilers today. You guys, uh, um, you guys I want go down well, the rabbit hole there's the book there's the book and, and, and it's uh for now until the rise and fall of the Chalcedonian church is written um for now it's the most orthodox book on that topic <laughs> and and that's why i really recommend it to oriental orthodox audiences because i think they will see this and they'll be like finally someone speaking about this issue from a perspective that actually makes sense mm -hmm. and and i think that's really really important um, for Oriental Orthodox. I also think there's a very good excursus on canon law, which is very interesting because I think that's something that uh, that may separate us, the Eastern Orthodox from Oriental Orthodox, uh, but there is a really um, intricate and holistic view of canon law in Eastern Orthodoxy, which, by the way, in the first millennium, the Mongolian Orthodox, 
because in the second millennium, we see there's been some development there. It's one of those things where, again, I'm writing candidly as a historian. I'm not writing as an apologist trying to make excuses for everything that we see in the history. Um, I, I meant a lot to me your endorsement uh, uh, when we're speaking uh, uh, before this show, being that you studied history, about like you don't know why the Roman Catholic side is not responding to this and how you know this book is the book on this topic. And so it's I, I really would appreciate from the Oriental Orthodox at Follow Your Channel to get this book and respond to it and interact and improve upon it from your own perspective. Because yes. I, I really yes. feel that is something that is sorely needed um, in this topic. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, that's exactly right. I think, I think this is um, a, a, this is something to be reckoned with. Uh, this book, um, and for them, for them to not read it, is almost like we don't want to see this. You know, like we're covering. We don't want to look that way. Uh, but this is, um, we are all seekers of truth here, so we should be reading this. Uh, and you know, Craig's not infallible. Craig's not claiming oh, to be. Absolutely not. Yeah. So, <laughs> so please, we want the back and forth. We want the discussion. I'm Oriental Orthodox, as you guys know. Craig is Eastern Orthodox. We don't agree on a lot of things, and we agree on things, and we talk about it all the time. It's been years like this, and uh, this this is how the discussion should be happening. Uh, absolutely. You have anything absolutely. else to add, Craig, to the to the show or to anything about the book? Mm -hmm. Anything else you want? I can say, guys, and links below. Thank you so much for having me on. And uh, it's really fun for me to kind of get to this from the perspective as much as possible for me as an outsider uh, from you guys to to get into uh, the Egypt, the Syrian, and, and some of the um, different perspectives that weigh in on this issue that are too neglected. And there's way more work to be done, I think, on that side. That's why I really think you guys, your side is a good book in you. And maybe your master's degree could offer this sort of path forward. Your master's thesis could offer the path forward. Thank you, Craig. Um, Oriental Orthodox, I'm very optimistic in the future of you kids. Uh, you are what, uh, in your teens, a lot of you, um, 19, 20 years old. Uh, you know, when I was 19, 20, I was illiterate as compared to you. So, um, uh, we are looking forward to whatever is going to come out from that world uh, coming soon. Um, the generations upcoming. We just got to America a generation ago, maybe. So get ready. Well, maybe uh, they're getting too American, these kids. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Thanks again, Craig. I appreciate you. Um, we'll be in touch, huh? Pray for Sounds me. Sounds good. Okay. Bye, everybody.